What's up, sons? It's Blind Rod with Son of a Tech once again, and I have another video card review for you guys today. It's going to be on the budget end with the XFX RX 460, and this is the 4 gigabyte trim, so stick around to find out more. So at first glance, I thought that this card had the hard swap fans that have been featured in a lot of the other XFX series cards, even including some of the RS lines from the 470 and 480. But with further examination, I realized that the fans are, even though removable and have that same design, do not have the quick disconnect pins and they're actually hardwired in. That was kind of a disappointment to me because I had some white LED fans I thought would be cool to go ahead and swap in for an extra 20 bucks. If if I wanted to and that's just because I also had them laying around so that was my biggest disappointment I guess so far with the visual appearance but if we move around the card you'll see that it is a nice red and black kind of scheme going to it which is cool because it is AMD of course and we have a pretty decent heat sink attached to the GPU core and it has two copper heat pipes coming out of it now keep in mind that the VRMs are passively cooled but of course this is a budget card so I wouldn't expect expect anything else. Now if we move around to the back plate or the back of the card there is no back plate but you will notice that the card is extended now this is because it is running a dual fan setup and that's just going to be the way it is. This is kind of similar or reminiscent of what they had to do with the GTX 1060 and even the RX 480 and RX 470. In addition to the XFX cutout, the RX 460 also includes a single DVI-D with an HDMI port and display port. Moving around the card, you'll see that we have a six pin power adapter. Now, from what I could tell, the max power draw here was about 110 watts, which isn't that bad if you consider the fact that it is actually drawing power from not only the PCI rail, but also that six pin power connector. With the PCI rail being rated at about 60 to 75 watts it's easy to assume that we have probably about 50 watts being pulled from the power supply itself. The only thing that kind of makes that a disappointment is that the similarly priced, however a little bit more, is the ASUS GTX 1050 Ti, which only pulled the 60 watts and didn't require a 6-pin adapter. Now I am aware there are RX 460 models that do not require additional power, but this one in particular does, and I feel like it's probably necessary to go ahead and point out. Alrighty, so we have an extra power adapter here, so let's talk about what we can get with the max overclock. The card comes out of the box clocked at 1220 megahertz, but with some tweaking, I was able to get the core clock up to 1350 megahertz max, and over some of my extended testing, I did notice some artifacting in some of the stress tests I did, and finally balanced out to about 1325 megahertz. Keep in mind that the 1050 Ti is a completely different design, so you can't really compare these directly on core clock. Now, one of the big disappointments here is I wasn't able to overclock the memory at all, and it wouldn't go even like five above the stock 1750. And that was even with turning the core clock all the way back down to its stock clock and then trying to move the mem clock up. I was unsuccessful. Your mileage may vary, of course. So with the overclock kind of set and all of that figured out, how were temps? Let's talk about that now. And I do want to clarify that these are all with the power settings up and as well as the overclock enabled. Now, if you leave the card at a stock fan profile where, keep in mind, it will stay turned off until it reaches past a certain point. You will see that the max temperature only hit about 71 degrees Celsius, and this was in about a 78 degree Fahrenheit room. It would be about 25 degrees Celsius in case you're curious. Bumping up the fan speed to about 60%, we kind of start getting the fan speed or the rotations per minute up to about 2,840, which sounds about right for these XFX fans. And we are able to keep the temps down to 65, degrees Celsius with 20 passes uh, in the fire strike kind of stress test there. If you want to go all out balls to the wall with the fan speed at 100% your max RPM or rate is going to be about 3,805 so about a thousand RPMs higher than the 60% mark but you're going to knock your temps down significantly down to 42 degrees Celsius and this is the first time that we see the card 
actually drop below the competitor, the Asus GTX 1050 Ti. Now that's relevant because it is drawing more power, which means that it's generating more heat than its competitor in the Asus 1050 Ti. So speaking of fan speed, what we're going to do is hop in and show you guys what the fans sound like. And we will start at kind of the offsetting pretty much because the fans do turn off. And then we're going to see what it sounds like at 60% and then you guys will be able to hear what it sounds like at full. So check the noise out now. All right, so there you go, guys. That's kind of what it sounds like. I hope that's kind of helping you all out. If you guys don't like the noise test and you think that there's a better idea, let me know in the comment section below. And as far as kind of DB level, we're looking around that 40 to 45 range. And that's going to be, you know, dependent on your room and other other aspects maybe your case etc but this was on an open test bench and it was kind of right up next to the card so now that we know cooling is pretty much not an issue here let's hop into some of the benchmarks we're going to start out with the synthetic benchmarks and in time spy with default settings we saw a score of 1908 which of course falls short of the 1050 ti but is also a little cheaper than the 1050 ti now if we bump over to fire strike which is probably more where I would see this card performing at which is the 1080p range we see a score of 6258 now I prefer about over that 7000 mark but this is still a good sign that we're not super super duper low here and let's go ahead and check out some of the real world tests if we hop into rise of the tomb raider with high settings in DirectX 12 we have a minimum FPS of 22 with an average of 46 and a max of 82. Now this is in that pre-built benchmark and there is that one section that always just hammers the cards pretty hard on its min and that's where I do pull the min from. The game itself if you're running it and just playing it performs above 30 FPS pretty steadily the entire time. I just wanted to make a note of that. Bumping over to Total War Warhammer on the Ultra preset in DirectX 12 we had a minimum FPS of 37 with an average of 40.4 and a max of 43. This is all performing quite well and probably right on par with where I would expect it to. However, in Total War, I was kind of expecting it to maybe beat out the Asus or the NVIDIA GTX 1050 Ti, just because it is optimized towards that. Unfortunately, it just doesn't seem to quite have that punch. Now, if we hop into Gears of War 4 at 1080p with the recommended settings and async enabled, we had a time between frames of 17.7, which is not that good. And then we had a min of 45.1 and an average FPS of 56.5. Now the reason I say 17.7 is not very good is because even to be attainable or for 60 FPS to even be a thing, we need to be around 16 or below. And so this is kind of getting out of that 60 FPS range at 1080p at this point, but you're talking about a card that's about 130 US dollars right now in the States. In conclusion, there are a lot of budget options lately for kind of graphics cards, and I feel like we're starting to get to that point with the RX 464 gigabyte where it's probably just best to save your money, meaning that like, especially if you're looking at this card, which already has a six pin adapter, you're probably going to want to start looking at something like an RX 470. And that would be kind of my recommendation is to save up and push yourself towards a 60 FPS 1080p gaming experience. And the RX 464 gigabytes not going to provide that. Now, if you're looking at saving some money, of course, and you kind of maybe want to upgrade later, Crossfire support 
is a lot better than SLI support now and all of the card lines from AMD support crossfire so you could crossfire the RX 460. Now if you got one without a six pin and let's say you had a motherboard that had two PCI rails but you didn't have a power supply that had you know enough I guess PCI express two pins then you could technically get away with running two of these cards in crossfire without any extra power consumption requirements which I do find super intriguing and I might try to test out and check out for you guys later on down the line. That's kind of one of those niche things that most people aren't going to consider but just for the sake of science or whatever the fuck it seems kind of cool to me so let me know if you guys are interested in that in the comment section below and until next time don't forget to like comment and subscribe down below. Check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash son of a tech for perks like access Access to the discord and being able to see benchmark charts early as well as having the chance to possibly win one of the cards that I've reviewed on the channel. Once again thanks for watching and I will see you next Tuesday.